God, we are grateful to you. For as we read these words, we recognize that these are the words of your servant. These are the words of, that you wrote to describe Jesus himself, the one who has set his face like a flint, something that we'll read about today. One, Lord God, who has turned his face to you to trust in your will, to trust in what you say, to walk, Lord God, in your path. This day, Lord God, that is the example that you hold up for each of us. Not to walk in our way, but Lord God, to walk in your path. This, Father, this is your right way. And we, at the beginning of this service, Lord God, invite you that in every way possible, that you will continually draw us into your way deepen, Father, our relationship, our trust, our hope in you, as only you can. In Jesus' name, amen. We have a few announcements to get to this morning before we go any further. Uh, First of all, we had a great time in the adult fellowship time this morning. Uh, Just an excellent opportunity, I thought, to kind of share some things that we've been doing as we go through the book of Ephesians. We uh, got about halfway through Ephesians 3 this morning and just talked about some amazing things. And I was really grateful for all of those who were there this morning, all of those who added to the conversation, and all of us who uh, were able to to talk about the ways that that even in the face of tragedy, even in the things that, that, that we have to deal with in this life, that God brings us through. And that it is God's intent to draw us into relationship with himself. It's been that since the beginning. What an amazing, amazing way to start off our Sunday morning. Thank you for all of those who were there and in attendance. Now, I don't know what happened in the children's class. Is everything good? But I have no doubt that our kids this morning heard and learned far more than what we did in the adult class. Because that's always the way that those classes work. We are so grateful for uh, the ladies who lead our children's uh, Sunday morning, uh, Sunday school time, and for the ways that, that our young people are learning and growing in the knowledge and understanding of God. Uh, speaking of youth and young people, we do want you to keep your, our youth in your prayers because our youth, remember, is, uh, includes not only those who are here on Sunday mornings, but also those who are here on Sunday afternoons. And so our Trail Life and American Heritage Girls are in full swing. Uh, American Heritage Girls... I think our meeting today, is that right? Is today one of their days? Supposed to be. All right. And, of course, Trail Life Boys will be here. Uh, the, the boys and uh, the girls, both both of those ministries are going exceedingly well, and we are so grateful for all the ways that God is continually helping both of those groups. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I'll let you know about a, a, a fundraiser that the American Heritage Girls were doing, and uh, those girls did an amazing job with their bake sale in front of Lowe's over Labor Day weekend. I believe Radine used to tell me that they raised enough to fund this entire semester through that one bake sale. Is that right? Wow, that's fabulous. So if you were able to... Really? Excellent. Wow, fabulous. Fabulous. I know that a few years ago, American Heritage Girls took on our front flower bed, and they were uh, able to use that and do that, uh, bring that up to date for us, make it really beautiful for us. And so we appreciate uh, all of the ways in which those young ladies are being led to serve uh, here at our church as well as out in our community. I I bring up the fundraiser to let you know about that, but also to let you know that Trail Life is starting a fundraiser. I believe all of the stuff will be handed out this afternoon, and so I'll have more information about it by next week. But uh, please know this is a fundraiser that Rachel and I have participated in in the last couple of years, and uh, what they are selling is really worth buying. I'm just going to put that out there for you. But it's a really, uh, it's a really cool thing, and I will uh, have more information for you next week. Discipleship study Wednesday at 7 p.m. Uh, we're going to have a great time as always. And so I invite you and encourage you to come. If you haven't been coming on Wednesday nights, uh, please know that that opportunity is there. I invite you to come for that. Uh, speaking of opportunities, and we have a, a, 
a great opportunity in front of us uh, to invite some of the other local churches uh, to come and share with us uh, for, we were calling it a song service, I don't know what else to call it, but uh, on the 29th of this month to, uh, to come and to be a part of, uh, uh, just to make some, some connections to, to remind ourselves that, that what God is calling us to is bigger than just the church on this corner, but God's kingdom is far bigger than that. And so we are inviting some of the, the churches that, that God has kind of brought into our path over the last year or so and uh, coming together for a time of, of singing, a time of praise, and uh, a time of having some cookies together afterwards. So I encourage you, if you can come on Sunday the 29th to do so, and don't forget to invite folks, uh, some folks who you know, perhaps from other churches, they might not come to church here, but invite them and tell them that we would love to have them on the 29th at 5.30. Uh, men's retreat is being scheduled at uh, Lakeview Methodist Conference Center. That's in uh, Palestine, Texas, October 11th through the 13th. Uh, the cost is $120. Uh, the meals are provided by center staff, and it says that, that online is uh, how you sign up for this. There is a form, and if you're interested in this, please, please, please let me know, let James know, and we can certainly get that, that information to you and help you sign up if you need help doing so. Uh, Interchurch Council meeting is coming up. That's Saturday, October the 19th. That'll be down in, in College Station. So if you're part of Interchurch Council or would like to go to the Interchurch Council meeting, that is uh, the middle of next month, October the 19th. Uh, we talk about our offering basket. We talk about how uh, we have opportunity through our giving to be reminded of God's graciousness and God's provision in all things. Uh, I told you last week that uh, one of the things that, that we like to mention is the ways in which uh, God takes our giving and blesses that and uses it to help fund some of these other opportunities for ministry that God has placed in front of us. Uh, whether that's missionaries around the world, uh, we heard from uh, uh, one of our missionaries this past Wednesday night who was kind of passing through town and, we, and he stopped by and had an opportunity to bring us up to date on the eight different countries that he's been to in the last six months. Uh, but on a closer on a closer scale, our food pantry just right down the right down the road here open twice a month. Uh, I didn't have the numbers last week for you, but John uh, provided the numbers this this week for me. Uh, we I believe every week or every every other week when they meet, probably they set a new record now uh, for how many have been affected or it, not affected, but how many have been helped from the week before. Uh, this time around, total households, 398 households have been blessed by the opportunity to receive some food from the food pantry. Uh, that's almost 1,600 individuals, 1,591 total individuals, 25 new households over what had uh, been there the month before, and 84 new individuals. Um, as, I, as I've stated before, the food pantry here in Robinson serves more than just the Robinson community. And that pretty much happened during COVID when a lot of the area food, bank, food banks and food pantries shut down. They weren't able to handle the load. They weren't able to provide workers to, uh, to work in those situations. And the Robinson food pantry by God's blessing and by the way that God has, has used our congregation and other congregations and other corporations has uh, continued to provide the need for so many individuals who find themselves unable uh, to meet their food needs. And so what a blessing it is. Thank you for being a part of that through your giving, through your faithfulness, uh, through your trust in God's faithful provision. We are grateful to him for all of the ways that he provides. Let's pray. Father, it is a beautiful thing for your people to give thanks to you. And we do so now, Father, recognizing and realizing that you alone are the one providing for us in every single way. What we have, Father, we have through your blessing. What we have, Lord God, is a gift from you that we freely give back to you. Lord God, help us not to cling on to the things of this world, but instead, Father, to recognize it as a blessing from you 
and an opportunity to serve you by giving all that we are and all that we have. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. And let's stand together and respond to the word this morning. Sing together the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him. Take your hymnal, if you like, and turn to number 733. We're going to sing the song, Once to Every Man and Nation. scripture today comes from the letter of James in chapter 3 verses 1 through 12. My brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment, for we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle the whole body. Indeed, we put bits in horses' mouths mouth, that they may obey us, and we turn their whole body Look also at ships. Although they are so large and are driven by fierce winds, they are, not turned by, they are turned by a very small rudder wherever the pilot desires. Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. See how great a forest, a little light, a little fire kindles. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. 
The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and creature of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless our God and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring send forth fresh water and bitter from the same opening? Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives, or a grapevine bear fruit, figs? Thus no spring yields both salt water and fresh. John Wesley took that line right there in the middle of that passage, see how great a forest a little fire kindles, and he made that a positive thing when he sang about the gospel, the way it's growing as a fire among us. One of his songs was called, See How Great a Flame Aspires. We're going to sing that together. It's on the back of your bulletin if you'd like to look at that as we sing this morning. of faith, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is sitting at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. And from there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the one universal church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Glory be to the Father.
see you. As we uh, prepare to pray for one another, we do have a couple of things that I want to bring to your attention today. Some things that uh, we've mentioned, some of them from Wednesday night, some of them have been on the prayer list for quite a while, but I want to just bring them to your attention. Uh, continue to pray for Carlita. I know that uh, Rick has told us that she's continuing to get stronger uh, following her surgery. We are, of course, praying that she is uh, fully brought back to health and strength and uh, continue to pray for Rick as well as he is uh, being her nursemaid right now at this time. So uh, in spite of all that he's trying to do to injure himself to keep that from happening. No, I'm joking. But uh, we are very grateful for Rick for the ways that he is helping Carlita during this time, her time of recovery. I uh, continue to pray for Donna. I know that uh, we miss having her here, and I know that she has some, uh, some other issues and struggles that she's dealing with right now, but certainly in every way possible, continue to pray for Donna and for uh, God to touch and to heal and, and bring her back to us in short order. We do have a number of travelers this morning. Uh, the, the Tyndalls, I believe, are on the road. The Kays are, are uh, heading out and going somewhere and doing some things. Uh, the Macy's have, uh, have gone to visit some folks. And so it seems like I, it, it's always one of those things how uh, throughout the summer we always talk about, oh, we've got so-and-so going and these people going here. And our summer seems to get longer and longer every year. So uh, we have a number of folks who are traveling right now. So please be in prayer for all of those who are on the road, all of those who are traveling. And uh, as we remember one another, of course, we know that there are those among us who continually have the struggles and the issues that, uh, that we face as we are growing older, as we go through uh, the trials of life. And so I'm not going to name names. You know who you are but continue to, uh, to just pray for one another, and lift one another up. As God brings you, as God brings someone uh, in our congregation to your mind every week, I encourage you, pray for that person. Uh, ask God to use them and to touch them and to help them in every way possible. What a blessing it is to be able to pray for one another and to bring them before God's throne, God's throne of grace. Let's pray. Father, this morning as we come before you, we do so with humble hearts. But Father, with hearts that are filled with the joy of being able to enter into your presence, of being invited into your presence. Father, it's through, it's through your grace alone that we are able to step into your presence. And we thank you, Father, for all of the ways that you are at work and continue to be at work in us. We ask, Father, that you will uh, be with these needs that we've mentioned and with others, Father, that were left unmentioned, but yet known by you. We pray, Father, that those things that burden our hearts, Father, we know that they burden yours as well, and we lift them to you this morning. Father, we ask that you will be especially today at work in the lives of, of those folks who we name for Carlita, for Donna, uh, for others in our congregation, for Judy. Uh, who continually has these, uh, who, are, who are continually faced with these, with these health issues and these physical struggles that they're dealing with. Father, continue to touch, continue to help. Father, we pray also for those in our congregation who are still dealing with grief, who continue to deal with grief. We pray for, for Joanne, we pray for, um, for Jim and Judy as they are, are, are learning about life with the grief of of losing a child. And we ask, Father, that you will be with these, with these parents. Help them in every way possible, Lord God. We pray, Father, that you will uh, continue to be with those who are traveling among us, Father. For those who we name, Father, and others who we might not, not even be aware of, we ask, Father, that your hand of protection will be upon us. Father, in all of these things, as we lift up one another, we are reminded, Lord God, of your bond of love your bond, Lord God, which ties us all together, together in Christ. Lord, as we said this morning in, uh, in our adult Sunday school time, this is that mystery, Father, that we are all brought into your presence through the cross of Christ, through your grace, brought into your kingdom, your family, your body. Father, use us. Shape us. Send us, Father. We love you and we thank you for who you are. 
and for what you are doing in each of our lives. Hear us now, Father, as we join our hearts and our voices together, praying as Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our psalm reading this morning comes from Psalm 116, starting in verse 1. A psalmist writes these words, I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my supplications. A good reminder to us after we pray for one another. Because he has inclined his ear to me, therefore I will call upon him as long as I live. The pains of death surrounded me. The pains of Sheol lay hold of me. I found trouble and sorrow. Then I called upon the name of the Lord. O Lord, I implore you, I beg you, deliver my soul. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Yes, our God is merciful. The Lord preserves the simple. I was brought low and he saved me. Return to your rest, O my soul, for the Lord has dealt bountifully with you. For you have delivered my soul from death, my eyes from tears, and my feet from falling. I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. Let's stand and let's sing together hymn number 667, Lord Speak to Me. As we continue to pray and listen to what God has to say to us today. chapter 8 this morning. I find Mark chapter 8 about halfway through the gospel of Mark. And in Mark chapter 8, we find a lot of things going on. There's, there's, Mark chapter 8 is, uh, is just absolutely filled with uh, some amazing stuff that's happening here toward the end of Jesus' public ministry. But one of the things that we're going to focus on this morning is not something that happens publicly, but something that happens privately with Jesus and his disciples. This is one of the most amazing stories, I think, that we find in the gospel. Now, you've probably heard this passage before, but no matter how many times we've heard Jesus' words on this particular passage or from this passage, the power of his words remains. So let's read together. Or let's, let's, you follow along. I'll read, starting in verse 27. Now Jesus and his disciples went out to the towns of Caesarea Philippi. And on the road he asked his disciples, saying to them, Who do men say that I am? So they answered, John the Baptist, but some say Elijah and others, one of the prophets. 
And he said to them, Who do you say that I am? And Peter answered and said to him, You are the Christ. Then Jesus strictly warned them that they should tell no one about him. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke this word openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when he had turned around, when Jesus had turned around and looked again at the disciples, Jesus rebuked Peter. And he said, get behind me, Satan, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. When he had called the people to himself with his disciples also, he said to them, whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. And whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him the Son of Man also will be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. You may have noticed that this is a rather lengthy passage, especially for uh, something that you usually preach on a Sunday morning. It would be easy, truly, to get two, maybe even three sermons from this text, but we're going to try to narrow our focus, narrow this passage down to just simply one idea. How are Jesus' followers to live in this life, that's the question that's before us. How is it that Jesus' followers are called to live in this life? The passage here starts with Jesus' powerful and pointed question to his followers, who do you say that I am? This question has been asked in various ways and by various people since Jesus' public ministry started. But here, Jesus specifically asks his disciples what they have learned about his identity. Asking questions is a very important teaching tool. It was used by Jesus, and it is still used by good teachers today. If a student is only given the answers without having to think about the interaction between those answers and the things happening in his or her life, then the answers a student has will never be tried and will never stand up when life gets hard. I remember uh, having the answers in the back of the book, back of our math book when I was in high school, but you only had every other answer. So I was at least guaranteed to make a 50 in, in that class. But the answers, half of the answers were given so that you could check your own work. When I was going through here, did I get the right answer? So even though the answers were given, they were only given for the purpose of you being able to determine, am I understanding this? Am I doing the work properly? Am I doing it correctly to get to the right solution to the problem before me? When Jesus asks questions to his disciples, Jesus is wanting them to get to the right solution to understand the right answer to the question that's being done any teacher whether it's jesus or whether it's a teacher that we've had or folks who are teaching today if the teacher if the teacher is giving all of the answers without asking any questions then that teacher is only doing a halfway job of instructing the students And so Jesus asks questions to the disciples, and in doing so, asks those same questions to us as well. Now, there are two ways of understanding the question that Jesus asks the disciple. The question, of course, is, who do men say that I am? The first way of understanding this question is as an opinion poll. We might think that we're in a political season of the year. And as such, we're used to hearing politicians conduct opinion polls. These polls are done so the politicians can feel like they're better equipped to make promises to the people who they are hoping will vote for them. And when politicians make promises around election time, you know that they've done the research to determine what it is that they think the people want to hear them say. 
There's a problem with this line of thinking, though, when it comes to applying it to Jesus. Jesus' words and actions show us that Jesus did not care about the politics of, of leadership. Multiple times, Jesus criticized the leaders, the temple leaders especially, who were more concerned with holding on to political power than they were with actually serving God. Only a couple of weeks ago, we were looking at John chapter 6, and there, at the end of John chapter 6, we heard Jesus question his own followers about their reasons for staying with him. And we saw that many people who had been following Jesus at the beginning of that chapter, by the end of that chapter, went off to follow someone else, went off to look for someone else to follow. To think here that Jesus is asking this question as an opinion poll kind of question misses the point of everything the Bible teaches us about Jesus. So we have to then come to the second way of understanding Jesus' question, and that's this that Jesus is, Jesus is giving his disciples, through this question, the opportunity to express, to answer, what God has revealed to these disciples about who Jesus is. And we need to notice that Jesus and the disciples are traveling, not in Jerusalem, not right around Jerusalem, but they're traveling far north of Galilee. They're, I mean, they're way out of town. And they're in a region near a city that's called Caesarea Philippi. Caesarea Philippi was a large city. It was a Roman city. It was controlled. It controlled all of the surrounding villages and the suburbs. The city was renamed by Herod Philip, who was the son of Herod the Great. Remember Herod the Great from Luke chapter 2? The one to whom the Magi came. The one... Uh, who then declared that all baby boys under the age of two should be killed in Jerusalem and the surrounding region. His son named this city, renamed this city, changed its name in honor of Caesar Augustus. And the naming here seems to be an attempt to demand that others recognize the worldly authority and the self-proclaimed deity of both Caesar and Herod Philip, Caesarea, Caesar, Philippi, Herod Caesar, or Herod, Herod Philip. Here, in this Gentile stronghold, not just ruled by Romans, but also brought under the control of idolatry, of folks who said, I want you to worship at the, at the temple of Caesar, and I want you to worship the political power that's strong enough to make this happen, to rename an entire city, and to use that city to bring all of the surrounding regions under the control of Rome. Here in this Gentile stronghold of idolatry, Jesus wants his disciples to consider what they've learned about him and what they've learned about God's work through Jesus. And so we listen again to those answers that the disciples give to Jesus' question. Some say that you're John the Baptist, the fiery preacher out in the desert. Some say that you're Elijah, the prophet who wasn't afraid to stand up to the king. That answer made sense here in Caesarea Philippi. Maybe even one of the prophets. Matthew's gospel specifically mentions Jeremiah, the prophet who proclaimed God's truth to a generation of Israelites who refused to repent of their idolatry and who were then taken off by God in the exile. All of these proclaimers and preachers and teachers who are mentioned here were well known. They were respected by the disciples. It would be an honor to be linked with any of these. And so the disciples seem to be echoing what others have said about Jesus, what they've heard other people say, that the idea is that Jesus may be one of these past proclaimers and preachers who's come back to prepare the way for the Messiah to reign and to rule. But each of these answers only goes halfway to the truth. Like a prophet, Jesus has been given a message from God to proclaim. But to call Jesus a prophet only captures a small amount of Jesus' true purpose and ministry. Even if we call Jesus Elijah, the miracle-working stalwart of the Jewish faith, 
This only takes Jesus' true identity halfway to where we really need to see who he is. Yes, Jesus is standing against the powers of darkness. Yes, God is doing miracles through Jesus, but this is only half of what the disciples want the, of what Jesus wants the disciples and us to know about him. And so again, Jesus refines the question even more, not who do others say that I am, but who do you say that I am? Peter, bless Peter's heart. Peter jumps up with the right answer here. My New Testament professor used to say, I'm not sure that we give Peter enough credit for getting the right answer here. We're, we're ready to, to jump on Peter when he gives the wrong answer, but here Peter gives the right answer. He may, we find out that he might not have had all of the right answer, but he gives the right answer here. And Peter's answer is the answer Jesus is looking for. You are are the Christ. You are the anointed one of God. You are the Messiah. That word Messiah and Christ are intertwined and mean very much the same thing in the minds of the Hebrew people who would have heard it, in the minds of the Jewish people, or in the minds of the Greek followers who would have come later, who would have understood that this is the one anointed by God to be God's representative on earth, the one through whom God's kingdom is coming. Yes, Jesus says, you are right. Jesus is the anointed one of God, the one through whom freedom and salvation will come. Peter's answer doesn't stop at the halfway point of saying that Jesus is a prophet or a teacher from, from old, but instead Peter sees the whole truth. But in seeing the whole truth and proclaiming the whole truth, he only takes that truth halfway. Because immediately Jesus has to turn Peter's correct answer on its head. Jesus doesn't deny that he is the Messiah, but Jesus won't be the kind of Messiah that popular opinion wants him to be. The people expected Messiah to do two things. They wanted the Messiah to be a political leader who would put their needs first. Remember there in Caesarea Philippi. And so unlike one of the Herods, one of the puppet kings of the Roman Empire, unlike the Roman Empire itself, the people wanted someone who would put their needs first. They wanted him to be a military leader and to lead the armies of Israel into victorious and glorious battle over all of their Gentile foes. All of those folks who had enslaved and, and, and put down the Jews for centuries. Messiah was going to come, and he was going to kick them all right out of Israel. And God's kingdom was going to be established again on earth. That's what the people expected Messiah to do, to be a strong political leader, to give the people what they wanted, and to be a strong military leader and drive all of Israel's enemies out that Israel might be established again. The Messiah was a position of power, a position where someone could command and demand power and absolute, absolute submission to his rule. But that's not what Jesus does. Instead, he immediately starts talking about dying. He talks about going to Jerusalem, and he talks about the chief priests and the scribes putting Jesus to death. And Peter's had enough of this. And so Peter, we're told, rebukes Jesus. That word rebuke means to correct, to put in the right place. And he corrects Jesus, and he says, no, that can't be right. That is absolutely not what Messiah is supposed to be. Messiah is not someone who dies. Messiah is power. Messiah is strength. Messiah is leadership. And you're talking about going and dying. Messiah doesn't die. And Jesus immediately has to correct this. And he says to him, Peter. And he says this not only to Peter privately, but to all of the disciples who've heard this. And he says, Peter, your way is not God's way. Get behind me, Satan. Here, we hear the same words that Jesus had spoken during his temptation in the wilderness. 
And he spoke those to the adversary, to the adversary of God's people, to the Satan himself. And he said here to Peter, your way is exactly the temptation that has already been placed before me to do things in my power and not to do things surrender to God's will, to ignore and to bypass the cross, the way through which the power of sin and death can be broken and instead to go the way, any other way, not the way of submission, but the way of power. That was the temptation that was before Jesus. And that's why Jesus says to Peter, your way is not in line with God's way, Peter. Get that temptation away from me. Get behind me. I don't want to hear it. I don't want to go that way. I want to go God's way. Jesus makes very clear, very clear, that the path that God has placed him on is the path that will lead to Jerusalem. And it is in Jerusalem that the cross is in store for him there. Jesus has to correct Peter's way of thinking about the Messiah and the Messiah's ministry because Jesus has to correct not only Peter's way of thinking about that, but the way of all of the disciples who are thinking the same thing about Messiah and our way of thinking about Jesus as well of what it means to be a follower of Jesus, one who has Jesus' power to command, one who has God's authority behind him. But instead, Jesus says, no, no, to follow me, to be my follower, means that you take up your cross and you follow me on the path on which God is leading you. To turn away from the cross would be to turn away from following God's path and from walking in God's will. As we pass here, the halfway point of this section, let's pause for a moment. And let's think about how we answer Jesus' question. Jesus' question about his identity and his statement about cross-bearing needs to impact us as strongly as it impacted his followers so long ago with our words and with our lives, with our actions and our attitudes. Who do we say? Jesus is. Since we're in church, the answer that will be on most of our lips is the answer that Peter blurted out. Jesus is the Messiah. You are the Son of God, the one who can save us. And for many people, this answer means that if we say we believe in him, we can get out of this world and we can go to heaven when we die. If we want to make Jesus our ticket into God's heaven, then we have only heard half of Jesus' teaching because Jesus not only teaches about what happens when we die in Christ, but he also teaches about what happens as we live in Christ. Listen again to this last part of this section here and hear what Jesus is telling those folks and us as we gather around him here. Starting in verse 34 again, when he had called the people to himself, with his disciples also. He said to them, whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. Let me tell you this real quick. As we're here listening to this, we have to place ourselves in this crowd, this crowd that is gathered around Jesus, this crowd that is listening to him, explain what he's talking about. We're a part of this group. Each of us, whether we're here in person, whether we're watching online, we are a part of this group that Jesus has gathered around himself. Let him deny himself, Jesus says. Whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself. Take up his cross and follow me. Verse 35, for whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? What will a man give in exchange for his soul? Ooh, there's another sermon just in those two, those two questions. For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him 
the Son of Man also will be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Yes, there is eternity language here where Jesus is saying, don't make me ashamed of you. But what is it that Jesus would be ashamed of from those who call, him, call themselves his followers? It's in how we are choosing whether or not we will pick up the cross or whether or not we will go our own way. We get back to the heart of our original question. What does it mean to be a follower of Jesus? Jesus says clearly that his follower is not one who is casually involved with knowing things about Jesus. But Jesus' follower is one who is responding to God's call to lay down his or her life, his or her desires in exchange for the cross that God offers. At the end of this section, Jesus gives us one of the best descriptions of Christian discipleship, of Christian living. And there is nothing halfway about the life that we are told to live. Jesus tells us that God desires for each of us to live every single day surrendered to God's will. Many people today have the idea that when we recognize Jesus's identity, that we've come to the end of the discussion. But again, that's only the halfway point. Like it was for the disciples, recognizing the lordship of Jesus is not the end, but the beginning of our spiritual life and our journey with Christ. Each of the Gospels tells us that if we recognize Jesus' identity as the anointed Son of God, if we recognize his authority as our Lord, then we, as Jesus' followers, are to live as Jesus lived, which means in full obedience to God. Not halfway, but in full obedience to God. To love as Jesus loved. Again, not loving halfway, only those who love us in return, but even reaching out with God's truth to those who reject us and who reject God's truth. To go where Jesus went, not just halfway to those who are going to do something for us, but to go fully, even to those who are forgotten or pushed to the outskirts of our society. As we live, as we love, as we go, we take the cross of Jesus with us, daily choosing to surrender our will to God's will. For Mark's first readers, who were Christians suffering in the catacombs under Rome as they were suffering intense persecution from the Roman authorities, the question of Jesus' identity had to be received with the knowledge that taking up a cross could be a very literal kind of event. When we take up Jesus' cross, we do so with the recognition that we are making a choice to put God's will above our will. Bearing a cross isn't something that happens to us that we have no say in, like an illness or, or some tragedy in life. Bearing a cross means that we are choosing to love God more than we love ourselves or anyone else every single day. Walking with Jesus as his disciple is a choice to live fully surrendered to God. It's a choice to refuse to live halfway committed to God's plan and purpose. The Christian life, the life of discipleship, the life of full abundance and full blessing and full joy and full peace and full surrender is the life that God is calling each of us to live today and every single day day. As we sing our final song together today, I invite you, reflect as you're singing, reflect on these words, on the words of Jesus. Allow God to search you. Ask deeply. Let him ask the question, are you fully living for me? Do not accept a halfway life. Follow God fully.
Let's stand together and sing our closing hymn today, Living for Jesus, number 605 in your hymnals.
Father God, we have heard today from the scriptures your call for total surrender to you. Lord, you make that possible. That is your invitation. And it seems like we are on the losing end of that. But again, Lord, you turn our thoughts upside down and you turn the way that we see this on its head. And we realize, Lord God, that only in totally surrendering to you can we find life. Only in totally surrendering to you, Lord God, can we receive your offer of peace. Only in totally surrendering to you can we find fullness of life. Father, thank you. Thank you for your precious gift, for the hope that we have through Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Father, may this last song that we just sang, may that be the prayer of each of our hearts and minds today. And may you, Father, find us fully surrendered as we leave this place, surrendered to you, to your will, to your calling to go into this world and to take with us the good news that there is hope in this life of peace with God and of our sins forgiven. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. And as we close today, let's sing the servant song, the first verse of the servant song.